Thank you. Hi, hello everyone. Hello. Thank you for coming. So my name is Simone. Hello, my name is Andrea. We decided today to start with this list of names. This is actually the credits that usually goes at the end of the presentation. But these are the people who work with us since the beginning, uh, since we established our studio in uh, Amsterdam. Some people are still with us, others are not anymore. But the reason why we wanted to start with this is actually because we truly believe design, it is actually about collaboration. And, you know, we are the fruit of that. Our studio is what it is because me and Andrea collaborate together. So today we will go through, of course, the selections of our work, but especially at the beginning, we would like also to introduce you why we are interested in design and how come we got to do uh, this as a work. Also because we are two very different persons. I come from the northeast of Italy, while Andrea is from Sicily, and when I grow up, it is actually looking like this in winter. I bloody hate it, you know, it's, it is a flatland, fog, you know, I couldn't stand it. But what is great there is that actually production is fantastic, especially of furniture. But this is not how I got in contact with design, because actually my father was a farmer. Um, it was only when I started to study that my teachers introduced me to design, and I became a design geek. You know, I was 16, and instead of having a poster of a pop band in my room, I actually had a poster of an exhibition of Enzo Mari, Il Lavoro al Centro. It was an exhibition at the Design Museum there. And we very much like this title, Il Lavoro al Centro. That means the work at the center. But we will have the chance to speak about this also later in the presentation. Well, as Simone said, I grew up in a really different context than his. I come from a beautiful island where, you know, sun is shining all the time, so no fog there, thanks God. But that's not the only difference between the north and the south, of course. Because if in the north, industry uh, was common, in the south, rural uh, craft is the main production process. If in the north, uh, art and design exhibition is the norm, in the south, folk and religion events are, well, let's say, the only uh, art happenings. Uh, because of this, I never draw a precise line between uh, industry and craft. For me, design is about objects, uh, whatever, if they are industrial produced or not. So basically, when we were 19, uh, both me and Andrea decided to move to Florence independently. I mean, we didn't know each other yet. And we decided to go there to study because there was a school there called Isia, where uh, two of the founders were still teaching there, and they were the founders of the radical uh, group Archizum. So we were very much interested in uh, radical design, which is something that developed in the 70s as a reaction of the political turmoils of the 60s, because design in that moment was used not just as a way to adding new stuff in the world or to design, for instance, new architecture, but it was actually uh, about using design as a way of questioning the way we live, the way we produce. But when we arrived there, it was the 90s. The situation was completely different. Uh, these visionary ideas was not there anymore, and we had a very different experience. Yeah, indeed, we have been trained as a perfect tool for industry. We were asked all the time to give new shape to objects, while we were more interested in rethink about uh, objects. And actually, this is what we are really interested in. But do we need to shape a uh, new shape for a vacuum cleaner, or its archetype, the strobe room, is still where to start the design process? At that time, we were never asked, you know, the important question has, you know, who do you want to be as a designer, or how do you want to shape the future? So we started losing interest in design. We really thought, okay, this is not what we are interested in. Till the moment when we actually meet each other, and I decided to add this picture, not because it's particularly nice, but it's just me looking at Andrea from the back. And, you know, this is how we started working together, via our relationship. It has been really via living together, sharing our interests, speaking with each other, collecting objects, traveling, that we started rediscovering design from a very much more intimate perspective. And one of the things we did was also to go to Milan to see the graduation show uh, of all the schools that were coming to Milan from all over the world. And we very much connected to a design academy of, from Eindhoven. The reason why that happened is because we felt there was a generation 
our generation, show you a work we could connect with. We recognized design and what was happening there. And then we decided to move there with one shared portfolio. Uh, we did all the exams together. We graduated with one project in two. And then we started Forma Fantasma. So, you know, everybody's all the time asking us, but what does Forma Fantasma mean? You know, it's a composition of two words, Forma and Fantasma. Um, <coughs> Fantasma means ghost, and Forma is form. It's ghost shape or ghost form. And that is the reference to the fact that our design process, it is exactly a process. So the form is something that comes at the end. It's not that we are not interested in shaping objects, it's just that we start from a research and investigation. We always know where we start, but we never have any idea where we are going to end. Well, sometimes people ask us uh, which is our favorite tool for designing, and we say that it is Word. Word, because of course we are in two, so everything is fruit of a discussion. Well, most of the time, as you can see in this nice picture, really over-the-top discussion. And I'm doing like this, is, this expression, this is really an Italian expression to say, what are you fucking talking about, you know? Like, <laughs> and if you see like Simone, even don't look at me and he's like staring at the, you know, at the paper. And this is how we work together, you know? I'm actually the one that discuss, but I'm more on the back. And, uh, but almost all the time I'm taking decision instead of you, right? <laughs> Yeah, he, he basically just told you he's the boss and I'm just the one here presenting. That's right. Th that's actually how it is. <laughs> so, what are we busy with? Actually, so we are conceptual research-based practice with a focus on uh, materials and historical investigations. So we are going through some of the concepts that are part of our work. The first one is looking back to look forward. We truly believe the past is a great source of inspiration. I mean... That we know already, in a way. You know, we've seen with design, with fashion, a lot of designers look back in search for style, but that's not what we are interested in. We actually believe there is knowledge in the past that we as designers, we need to just embrace it. Recently, we got to know that, for instance, concrete was a Roman invention, but then the Romans didn't manage to understand that steels, uh, if you insert in concrete, then you get reinforced steel, which is a, you know, a material that completely changed our cities. But then what happened? This material got lost in time, and only during modernism it has been discovered. So thousands of years where air research completely uh, stopped. With Botanica, which is a project we started in 2011, uh, we started from this perspective. We looked back in search from uh, knowledge that could have a meaning in a contemporary time. Botanica is a commission from PLART, which is a foundation based in Naples, which is dedicated to the restoration of works of art and design in plastic. So the owner called us and she said, can you design the collections of works for me in plastics? And to tell you the truth, this is the image we had in our mind when she asked this. The patch of debris in the Atlantic Oceans. We thought, like, my goodness, we, we will never be able to do this. It, this is not, like, you know, we are very much more interested in natural materials. But this was also our uh, first uh, thought. It, it was very much based on a cliché. And this is where, where we ended up with. It's a collection of vessels which are actually displaying a collection of materials that are all coming from the past. These are uh, all raisins coming from plants or animal derivatives, based on recipes from the 18th and 19th century. So how, when we work, we take two very different paths. One is very intuitive and hands-on. And these are some of the uh, making process when we collected some of these materials and we and started testing them in, uh, in our own studio. And on the other side, we also speak with a lot of people which actually have knowledge. And for this project, we spoke with scientists, material historians, collectors, and a lot of people also on blogs online and, and so on. And this is, a, if you, know, you know, for us, it's a very a fantastic process. And this is an image, for instance, of how we started, so making very small samples and molding these materials into forms almost as a material of craft. As you can see, the, the, the forms of the pieces are very exuberant, even if they are still based on an archetypical form. And that's because at the beginning we were discarding all these organic forms coming from the material. But then we understood we should have let the material speak. Also because this is a fantastic way to um, let the user understand the origins of the material from the animal and the vegetal world. Another characteristic of our work is that often we have labels into products, and all these, these objects are labeled, and the label is part of the product. Uh, we do that because we actually 
have the feeling that in the world we are living in, we lack information. We don't know where things come from. And then we started this as a, as a way of uh, making sure that the user would be involved more in the production process of our objects. I'm not going to introduce you all the materials we worked with, but in particular, I would like to speak about two. Shellac, which is the one featured in this piece, and Wadrusi, which was the other one. Because when we started research, it is an ongoing research. So we started this quite a few years ago, mm -hmm. and then two years ago, Drog Design, which is a Dutch collective, they came to us and they said, OK, your investigation into these historical materials, into these plastics coming from the natural world, it's great, but can, can we help you more? Can we introduce you to somebody who can help you in understanding even more if these materials could have a meaning in the contemporary time? And then we got in contact with the Wageningen uh, University, which is the agricultural university in the Netherlands. And there we work with uh, scientists in order to understand if we could improve these materials. Shellac, for us, it is a fantastic material because it is actually a bug which colonized trees in uh, India and Indonesia. And basically what a bug do is that it completely cover a tree, suck the sap from inside it, and sweat it out in a form of a more refined polymer. Basically, this bug is like a little factory, which is already working for us. The problem is that, of course, you know, the bug is very little, the production is very little, it is totally not engineered. So it seems a very crazy idea to think that plastic can actually be harvested and grown. On the other side, if you compare it to what is already happening in, with silk, you know, we still have worms giving us a fantastic fabric, so why not plastic? So this is something we are still working on. It is, of course, a very difficult process that we would need a lot of you know, money for research. But you know, what we also try to do with them is understanding the properties of the material, understanding how the shellac could be applied. And we tested it on a 3D printer because of the quality of the material, low melting point and it, it is possible to extrude it, basically. The other material said is the Wadrusi, which is a mixture of sawdust and a protein, which can be found in animal blood or albumen. Basically, what happened is that proteins with high pressure, not all the protein, but some proteins, mm -hmm. they have the ability to bind the fibers together in order to create a composite material. So with the university, we try to understand if there is a possibility to substitute glue with a uh, protein uh, as a binder. And all these, you know, the, the, the basic information from these uh, materials are all coming from a few centuries ago. Another very important part of our work is that we are very much uh, inspired by vernacular objects in the rural world. If you think about the forms of uh, botanica, they are very archetypical, despite also very organic. And Autarchy, which is the first project we did after our graduation, it is exactly about this, the, um, the fact that you are fascinated by rural culture. This is a festivity that is happening in uh, Sicily called uh, Le Cene di San Giuseppe, the uh, dinners of St. Joseph, where the community there meets to bake enormous quantities of bread decoration. I mean, I'm not here saying that this is great, it's slightly kitsch, but what is fascinating is that these people are just meeting to embrace production. I mean, you can consider this production at the end of the day. They just knew, use the knowledge they have, and they just celebrate the making altogether. And for us, this is amazing, because, you know, me and Andrea, we grow up in Europe, and production is disappearing there, you know? And we, we really believe that via producing, you know, humans have the ability to understand who they are and, what, and the way we want to shape the future. We don't think designing services in, is enough. Production is a value. It's dignifying humans. So, outer kit is actually about this. We wanted to use a very um, simple, biodegradable material that could almost be applied everywhere in the world. So, the vessels that you see on the table, these, these are not ceramics. It's actually a mixture of agricultural waste, flour, natural limestone, and all the colors are coming from natural dyes. So it is a very approachable material, very easy to work. And also what we like when we present our work is not just to place the objects on top of the pedestal. We also like to create an installation where you as a viewer can engage with uh, where we are coming from, uh, how we produce the things. It's a way to create transparency in the way we create our work.
And this is how sometimes our studio look. It looks in between like bakery or a laboratory and not really like an office. But it's a very fun you know, part of our work where you, you can really shift from uh, thinking and then on the other side making. And this is a graph which has been published on Domus magazine a, a few years ago, which exemplify that our way of working is like, almost like a constellation. So these are all the people who contribute when we work on something. So of course it starts from us, it always starts from a very intimate perspective, and then it grows like, uh, like a plant. So, as you um, might have seen with Botanica and Autarchy, these two projects have uh, in the core uh, a material research approach. But, in a way, let's say that this is like really what interested us when we designed. But we are not just interested in merely giving shape to a matter, but really to create it. But for sure not on a technical level, because neither me and Simone are uh, engineer or technician. We are really fascinated by the express expressive potential of material and the ability to ev evoke mem memories in the user. Uh, certain materials, uh, such as like concrete, marble, wood, embed an history that have been shaped during time. Uh, indeed, like this project we are going to present it now is called the Natura Fossilium, as really uh, as a core uh, a material research, actually on lava, so a really crazy material from the Mount Etna in Sicily. So it always goes like this. Basically, me and I, we are in the office in Holland, we are tired, and we say, let's go on holiday. Because he's Sicilian, we always end up being there. And... Um, so we get there, we say, okay, could now be we... worse, then. Yeah, it could be worse. <laughs> wow. So we the plan to relax, and because we relax, our mind open up, and then we start working again. So this is us visiting the mountain there. And if you visit it, it is an amazing experience, but what you notice is a fantastic landscape, and then you see, like, tourists walking on it, as the two of us here. And then you understand that this is very, almost symbolic of the southern regions of Europe, and especially of Italy. You know, the landscape is entertainment for tourists, it's just pretty. But for us designers, the landscape there was completely different things. For us, it was uh, about production. And we have this little movie that we did with our iPhones while we were there, because we had the chance to see an explosion there, yeah, yeah. which is completely overwhelming. It's like a punk concert. You really see like, the force of nature coming up, and it's absolutely emotional. And so the column that you see here of, of smoke, this is actually not smoke, these are debris. So for us, the mountain is like a mine, but without miners. It's nature which is throwing out materials. So when this is happening, this is a street close to the mountain. It's completely covered with black matter. And then people, they just clean it and life starts again. But then we started wondering, can we do something with this? This is material, can we, can we work with it? So we found these pictures of the 70s, which we find fantastic. It's a man who is trying to collect lava from there and molding it into a matrix. We think this is very symbolic of the nature of humans, you know, that they want to control nature. That it's actually also what we try to do. So we went to the Vulcanology Center there in Catania to understand what is actually inside the stones, and then to again acquire actual and factual knowledge about the context. On the other side, again, experiments. So this is us in a metal foundry in Eindhoven, uh, where we started remelting the rocks, and we found out intuitively that the percentage of silicium, which is the basic uh, material glass is based on, is an important part of the rocks there. So from uh, Eindhoven, we started moving to Murano, because we started thinking, OK, maybe we can work uh, the material with somebody which is very good in, uh, in working with glass. And we found somebody crazy enough to let us experiment with lava in their kiln, because that is, you know, once you use lava, you cannot use glass anymore there. And it was a fantastic experience, because we had all this team of craftsmen in which were very proud to be experimenting with something new. And it was also technically very complex, but it was also very exciting. So this is where we started to end up with. So we very much loved, at the beginning, how the glass was very rough, with very, uh, you could see all the inclusions of the minerals of the stone, but that was not possible to control. So we had to melt even more the stones and then to start mouth blowing with uh, the craftsmen there. And this is one of the final uh, pieces. It's a mouth blown lavic glass. And if you see the, the work, it is always presented with a piece of the rock from there. 
This is our own way, again, to embed in the final result part of the process. It is where we start and where we end. We also designed a uh, hanging mirror in Lavic Glass. And we, of course, also work with uh, the craftsmen around the volcano, which are working with basalt stone, with a series of stools paired with uh, brass. And, for instance, this is a coffee table. And we are mentioning it here in the presentation because it exemplifies how we get inspired by the location. So on one side you have the, uh, the mine with all the strata, and on the other side you have the table. And you see the darker stone at the bottom is actually one of the earliest eruptions, while the one on the top is more texturized, is actually the most recent one. So sometimes via discovering this knowledge while we work, this is affecting our uh, design. And we also uh, wove together lavic fibers with cotton. Because when you melt lava, you can also obtain fibers. And we decided to weave together with cotton in this artwork, where we mixed both uh, mythological references on the volcano and scientific one. Uh, again, when we present, we want to make sure that the user is involved in what we do. And then we accompany the work with a photographic series on the location. So designing context, you know, uh, as you saw also with the Natura Fossilium, for us uh, it is very much important that uh, designers have the ability to respect a context. We don't want to stay in our own studio, designing a form and then finding a producer. That's not what we are interested in. We like when the context is affecting what we do. So modern tradition is actually our graduation. It is a perfect example of this. We started from a place in Sicily where they produce maiolica, which is a ceramic, and we went there with the idea of, of working with the local producer there. But then what we found out is that the, one of the most common artwork there is a vase with the face of an African. And then we started wondering, okay, how come is this part of this context? Why is this part of local culture there? Also because speaking with craft, craftsmen there, they were all saying, you know, we are doing this, we are repeating these artworks because it is a way to testify uh, local culture. But this instead for us is actually showing how local culture is much more complex than what we think. Uh, Maiolica ceramic has been imported by African Arabs in the 10th century, so during medieval time, first in Spain and in Italy, and there it became traditional in all Europe. So this work is actually testifying how uh, local culture is, is layered. But the problem is that because we live in a contemporary time, when we saw this piece, we thought it wasn't an homage to where Maiolica was coming from, but it was grotesque and almost insulting, since uh, Sicily is in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, and every day there, there are a lot of refugees which come from the north countries of Africa to Europe. So we thought this is exemplifying the problems that there is between Europe and migration flows, because you know, we really are uh, feeling threatened that the culture will change. So what we did is layering an element of reality on traditional forms that we found in the museum of the city there. So we substituted the grotesque of the first piece with an actual person, with an actual refugee. And then we layered the, the, the objects with information, either historical or from the contemporary time. Uh, this has been a very criticized work, and a lot of people told us, why should you talk about these issues in design? But I mean, you know, this is an example of how objects are not there just to contain flowers if it's a vase or a chair to sit on it. You know, objects are much more than that. So this, this is a work that shows exactly that. O um, objects has a symbolic meaning, and we as designers have the responsibility to deal with that also. So another part of our work is challenging cliché and stereotypes. Every work we uh, do, also when we work with a client, is always wondering why. Why are you doing this? Why is it not different? Uh, where is, is this idea coming from? And this commission of uh, Fendi, uh, the fashion brand, Craftica, in 2011, is an example of that. The company asked us if we could look at leather as a material uh, from our own perspective. What we found out when we visited the craftsmen of the company, which they were absolutely fantastic, is that more, some animals are more precious than others. There are some skin that are considered more precious than others. If an animal is rare, then the skin is more precious. So we really wanted to fight back this idea of exotic. And the collections of tools that you see here and the one that you saw before are actually 
covered with very simple and humble skins, which have been and, uh, vegetal tanned, which is a more sustainable uh, tanning process. And there are salmon skin, wolfish skin, perch fish. We really wanted to make clear that there is a connection between the food industry and the production of leather. But a lot of people don't like to be reminded of this. People don't want to accept or to be reminded that leather is a dead animal. So we had to fight also with the company in inserting some of these materials because we wanted to make clear inside this connection. And in installation, we also had, for instance, this glass piece that has been mouth blown into a cow bone, or a series of pieces that use uh, animal bladders. Animal bladders are actually, it's a fantastic skin. It is um, a leather for us, which is very thin, very resistant, and it has the ability of containing liquids. This is also the way we like to work when we have a partner or a company. You know, we um, want them to open up and to show us um, also what they need. And charcoal is an example of how sometimes we make a bridge between our research-based practice and a larger producer. So this was a commission from the Vital Design Museum, and they asked us if we could work with a charcoal burner from there, which is a very old technique of burning and producing charcoal. Basically, wood is laid into uh, like a mountain, and then it's covered with earth and charcoal and water and branches. And because air is not there anymore, the wood inside slowly burns. And then what happens is that the molecule of wood basically explodes, and then charcoal turns into activated charcoal. We all know how symbolically charcoal has sometimes very negative connotation. But what is interesting about activated charcoal is actually it has the ability to absorb negative elements in water and in air. So our idea was that we wanted to carve some <coughs> massive pieces of wood, uh, carbonize them into this chamber, and then pairing it with crystal and copper in a series of tools to purify water. So this is the, the final result. But these were just a series of prototypes because the production process was very you know, artisanal, it wasn't very efficient. So at the beginning, we said we couldn't go ahead with the work. But then we got in contact with Lobmeyer, which is a traditional producer of crystal in Vienna. It's a wonderful craft, still based in the city. And we started collaborating with them, and then we designed for them a series of pieces for a sort of ritual of water purification. What Lobmeyer asked us also is if we could work with the engraving of crystal. He said, we cannot find designers anymore, they want to work with decoration, but we have skills in this company, we have people who, which are great in engraving crystal, can you do a new pattern for us? So, at the beginning we, we thought of looking back in what they had in their archive, but then we want to introduce something new, and instead of looking around or far, we actually look inside our own work. So if this work is about water purification, then the pattern that you see here, that almost look like rice uh, seeds, it are actually cholera bacteria, which is actually the first element that humans wanted to discard uh, from uh, water. And another part that is very important for us is to respect, as we said thousands of times, the context. So in our collection, we also introduce um, one of their historical pieces, this crystal piece that you see here, and we designed a copper spoon for it. So we always like to create a bridge between uh, you know, the contemporary and the past. So we are getting at the end of our presentation, and I think now you know, uh, we are all wondering you know, which will be our next step and what are we looking for. Collaboration again. You know, we had sometimes uh, industrial producer coming to us asking if we could design something for them, and we are interested in that. But often people ask us, they come in our studio and say, can you send us a drawing? Can you propose something? And we don't like that. We find that very lazy. We want to engage with people. We want to um, start a collaboration where we are not just delivering something that we design in our own studio. We want to work within their company. Uh, we want to take the work at the center. You know, I think we grow up in a very different moment than in the 90s, for instance. And I don't. To tell you the truth, I don't think we even care that our name is in the product we design. Of course we care, but 
Is that very important if, on the other side, we don't know where a product is coming from, who produced it? I mean, who cares if, if you know my name is on it, but you don't know how, which is the production process for it? So I think we as designers, what we would like to is to be embraced by a company which is letting us also design not only the final result, but also the process that leads to its, to its production. Basically, we want to see transparency in the production process. Otherwise, we don't, we don't care, basically. So, to end up our presentation, we would like to end up with a very big and gigantic why, which is what we ask ourselves every day when we are in our studio. We ask ourselves why we are doing this work, why are we designing, why are we engaging with this work. Because we truly believe that if we don't ask these questions constantly to us, we will never be able to move forward and to question also ourselves and to have an impact also in the world. Thank you. Yes.